Well, hello to the IdeaPod Facebook audience. My name's Justin Brown, one of the founders of IdeaPod, and I'm very excited to be here with Greg Copley, one of the keynote speakers at the Australian Leadership Retreat here on the Gold Coast. Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Yeah, Great fellow fellow Australian. I know yeah. you're based in Washington, aren't you? Yes, but always wonderful to be back home. Oh, yeah. No, um, also for me, uh, we've, we've been based in Los Angeles for a while, so it's good to come home to Australia and uh, talk to the IdeaPod community about some big ideas. And I really enjoyed your keynote presentation last night. And there are a few big ideas that came through that I wanted the IdeaPod community to get a chance to you know, soak up and hopefully open our minds and learn and grow and evolve and have our perspectives challenged. One of the perspectives that's very strong, particularly in California, is around the ideas of the singularity. The ideas that by the year 2045, man may merge with machines and we're going to have a future that we can't even begin to imagine what it's going to be like, that there's so much progress, so much optimism, we need to stop thinking the world is getting worse, the world is getting better, and there's so many different indicators there. I was wondering if you have any reaction to, to that. Well, I want to wait till the singing of the chorus of Kumbaya dies down. Uh, the reality is that we, we, we see the world divided into people who think about the future in, in either utopianist terms, such as that uh, La La Land view, or in Armageddonist terms, that the world is going to dis be destroyed. The reality is that it's somewhere in between, and the fact that we have a lot of new technology now uh, is just another version of history. This is nothing new. We've seen new technologies be greatly disruptive positively and negatively, of, of uh, human society over, uh, over decades. The reality is that we're in a period now of uh, enormous change, and that enormous change is not going to be so much about technology. The technology is important. Actually, techno technological growth or the growth of disruptive technologies is not occurring at the same rate it was a decade or two ago. Yeah, that's interesting. In, in fact, uh, Andre Geim, who uh, won the... Uh, 2010 Nobel Prize for Physics said, we're not creating sufficient disruptive technologies to continue the pace of human economic and social development that we saw over the past few decades. So uh, we, we need to be careful about this linear view that everything will go as, 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 uh, as a, uh, an extrapolation of that, uh, a brief recent history. The reality is that uh, historical trends tend to be fairly short. Uh, and there's always a disruption. This is the interesting thing. We, we keep thinking that nothing is ever going to disrupt uh, our present way of life. What we've experienced we can only continue and it can only get better. The reality is that there will be changes. And what is the big change? The big change is that we're coming towards a period of enormous population decline. Now, this is disguised. It's going to be global, but it's going to be patchy. It's, going to, it's starting to happen already in the major urban, urbanized, advanced industrial societies particularly. Uh, what we saw with the baby boom generation, which was the result of the technology and wealth uh, which was introduced after World War II, we saw the global population rise from 2.5 billion people to 7.5 billion today. That was an unprecedented spike in population. Now, right. the, that urban, urbanized population, as it became more urbanized, uh, then changed its reproductive patterns. So what we're seeing is that Urbanized societies and modern wealthy societies do not actually reproduce enough to replace themselves. Right, yeah. So the baby boomers are coming to the end of their lives. Right. And when they die, they haven't replaced themselves. So there's a big gap. Even if you disregard the impact of, of economic trends on health care and, and, uh, and the like, and, uh, and on which sectors of society get appropriate health care and the like. So uh, really we're seeing a tremendous change in the number of humans on the planet. Now this is being disguised by urbanization. People are still moving from rural areas to urban areas and that's facilitated by greater automation in, in agricultural production which helps a lot but it's mainly driven not by that, it's driven by the appeal of the cities. Um, now uh, then we're seeing this, this population decline being disguised by inward migration. Right. So this changes the nature of societies, it change, changes their cohesion, changes their productivity yeah. So uh, the question is, will the society of the future, whether it's in Australia or the United States or Western Europe, transform because the society doesn't have the same productivity ideals and communication skills and social cohesion skills that a, a more unified society had in the past? Right. We, we know the answer to that. We know that there will be less 
productive in many ways. Okay. Uh, so therefore, we look at the economic performance declining. At the same time, if the population of the city starts to decline, that changes the overall economics of everything because our ability to amass capital to invest in R&D and the like comes from real estate, and particularly urban real estate. People leverage that real estate for credit. That's what gives us our, our great credit-based economies. Yeah. If the value of urban real estate declines, right. then you can't leverage as much capital out of it for investment. So the whole economic uh, situation starts to change. Yeah. So a lot of people will uh, start to move out of the cities again. Uh, what we'll see is that the cities themselves will become less appealing. Yep. They'll become less productive. People will, will have less wealth by our current standards of measure. So what we need to do is come up with new economic models to to take advantage of this change situation. Yeah. What we, we had in the past was a, an era of uh, constantly rising demand because we've had a constantly rising population base. So we've had a, an era of consumerism and rising scale. Right. That is now coming to an end. Right. The question is, how do we cope uh, in, in other ways? And there are a lot of things which are happening to help that. For example, moving away from mass uh, grid-connected uh, electricity and computerization down to autonomous areas of uh, electric power generation, which is critical, because here we are uh, less than 150 years after the introduction of electricity, and okay. right now we are existentially dependent on the second-by-second -second delivery of electricity. Okay. If that is disrupted by, say, cyber warfare or by natural disasters, how do we cope? Cities cope very badly, we know that. Yeah. Uh, because if you, if you sh in the northeast uh, U.S. corridor from, say, Washington, D.C., up into uh, uh, Montreal area, if you turn off the electricity for two weeks, you've got 30, 40 million people dead because they can't get food, they can't access food, they can't access uh, petrol and ga gasoline from, yeah. from the petrol stations. Uh, their sewage systems back up, so the water supplies become polluted. And how are you going to move in uh, enough food and water to cope with that population base in those urban areas. Right. You can't. Yeah. And the reality is that you have tens of millions of people dying. So it's, in effect, cyber weapons and natural disasters can have effects which are far, far greater than nuclear weapons. Right. Nuclear weapons are so 20th century. <laughs> and so, I mean, okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I do just want to pick up on the, the idea of cyber warfare mm -hmm. and the northeast of the US, and I heard you say last night and you mentioned it now, 20 or 30 million people you shut down the electricity, you shut down the cities, and there's so much interdependency going on that people start probably starving pretty quickly and um, diseases run rampant and it's absolute chaos. Uh, what, do you, what do you feel that, for anyone watching this, and they're probably thinking, wow, like, you know, this is not the stuff that's spoken about in the media so much, uh, how can individuals prepare? Should we be more resilient? Should we, what should we do? No question about it. Even in urban societies, people can take steps. I mean, the, uh, being, having an autonomous supply of electricity is the first thing, and that's right. starting to happen. I mean, uh, the uh, autonomous gathering and storing of electricity off-grid is possible. People are doing it with solar panels on their roofs, and, right. and storage uh, instruments, batteries, are becoming far more uh, capable than they were even a decade ago. Yeah. So you can say, OK, I've got my, my pod protected. Uh, I'm not suggesting you go into the survivalist mode and, and necessarily stockpile large amounts of food, but uh, in frankly, some prudence there is, is worth thinking about. Yeah. But also, you need to start individualizing the, the question of water purification, because water, uh, water supplies, polluted water supplies, will, will actually start to kill you faster than the lack of food. Right. Uh, so, uh, and water purification needs to be thought of in new technolo uh, technological terms. And our institute, the International Strategic Studies Association, started looking at how do we move beyond our current uh, approach to water purification because reverse osmosis technologies developed during World War II are highly energy dependent. They, they use vast amounts of power. They are high pressure systems and that means that they burn through uh, filters at a, at a high rate. So we, we started to say, well, what we need for urban survival situations is the same thing that, uh, that uh, forward deployed armies need. They need uh, the ability to have systems which will purify water uh, to a high degree, get rid of all bacteriological and viral contaminants, and do it um, without 
any external power and without resource, uh, resourcing diesel uh, fuel to power generators. So solar, batteries, and, and then a system which can purify without the requirement to keep changing filters. Yeah. Because when the U.S. Armed Forces went into Iraq, for example, uh, they started burning through uh, about twenty thousand dollars worth of filters uh, per month yep. just to 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 filter the, the the water. That's that's untenable for most people. It's untenable for armies, let alone right. for uh, for private citizens. So you need to have something which is going to last you for decades. It's it's you're independently powering up, and you can say, well, look, and I've got my electricity, I've got my power. Uh, and with that, you can also have autonomous means of communication. You can have your own uh, communications devices, which will, re will, will be able to survive when uh, internet's down or, or not regularly available, or when telephone systems are down and not regularly available. Right, right. So you need to have that uh, ability. And th these are the technologies which will transform the way we live, because we'll get off the, the grid, Yep. And the grid is the, the greatest area of vulnerability to cyber warfare. Right. Uh, and the fact that we've got smart homes means that you can that anyone with a cyber weapon can access the grid through any home yeah. because it's now totally porous. Right. So the reality is that you have to remove yourself from the grid, or, uh, and and so societies will move to to smaller power uh, dependencies. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know there are, there are all manners of of, of uh, those and that's, that's really a national security thing anyway, to have your citizens that are resilient, that are decentralised, right. because then your, your nation is, is less vulnerable to a, an external threat. And to, to get back to the ideas of the singularity and the, the kind of uh, almost the techno-optimism that I particularly see mm. in the United States of America, mm. where you and I spend so much time, uh, do you feel that's misplaced because of the uh, global geopolitical context combined with all of this centralisation of, of infrastructure? Or how, how do you, and there's just not enough disruptive technology to keep pace with the declining economy and things like that? Or mm. how, how do you see that? And what, what do you think of, for example, Ray Kurzweil's ideas around the singularity and where we're headed? Uh, well, I haven't studied his, his particular theory right. enough, but, uh, but, but frankly, I think it's, uh, it is uh, utopianist. Yes. Uh, there's no question that we can make uh, machines far more appealing and productive for, on, our, on human behalf. Uh, we already see, we see that every day, actually, with uh, 3D printing, uh, with automation of manufacturing in many respects, and that's right. that's great. The question is, how much more can we expect to see? Are certain things technologically capable, uh, achievable? Absolutely. Uh, one of the points I made last night was that, and I made it in a book in 2006. Said, look, look, if the if the Roman civilization had had not collapsed, we might have seen supersonic air travel by the 15th century. But the Roman civilization did collapse. Oh, God, there's the Dark Ages. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so basically, life happens. Uh, life interrupts both the utopianists and the Armageddonists. Right. So, uh, we have to look uh, at, at a balance of what's probable rather than what's possible. Right. Many things are theoretically possible if you take a linear view of or extrapolation of, of what we've just seen and and what. Uh, People say, well, we've got the iPad, therefore we can do anything. Well, so what? Um, the reality is that you might have to uh, not replace your iPad with the next model as rapidly as we're doing today, yeah. as economic conditions determine that. Uh, what we've seen uh, develop, particularly in the United States, and we're seeing it in Australia as well, is this view that there is a new form of materialism which is underway. Uh, and. It's not the materialism of ownership, it's the materialism of having. So people want to have the latest of everything and when they're finished with it, they just throw it away. It's, there's no pride of ownership uh, because it's, it's just seen as a, as a transactional right. commodity. Right. And now just to, just to finish up, I just want to repeat one line I heard in the, in the speech last night, which is that whenever there's m manure in your streets, there's probably a pony somewhere. So essentially you are an optimist. You bet. How do you explain after this, I mean, incredible presentation, <laughs> that my mind is quite definitely expanded with that whole framework that you've presented. Um, where are the ponies in your, in your perspective of the world? Well, it, uh, when you see a, a break in a very rigid uh, social structure, right. uh, you see opportunity. Yep. Uh, what we've seen uh, is that we're, we're leaving a period which is a managed period. 
we're, we're seeing openings in that, we're seeing cracks in the system, we're seeing the opportunities for people to take initiatives, to take leadership, uh, to create new ways of, of uh, uh, making money, whatever, yes. whatever money is in the future, it may be a different form than we're seeing today, and this is why we're seeing the rise some, some of Some gold in hand or, or, yeah. or cryptocurrencies or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. There are many options there. Yeah. And uh, so basically, uh, it's, a, it's a period where we, we can have flexibility, we can have leadership and entrepreneurship at a greater uh, rate than we've seen in the past few decades. Right, okay. Well, for everyone out there, that, that is a positive message. There are ponies in your life. It's not all just uh, manure everywhere. Uh, thanks, Greg, for that amazing perspective. Please do hit the share button if, you've, uh, if you feel this is a message or these are messages that need to be shared and more people need to be aware of. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Really appreciate Great. your time. Great to be with you. Okay, bye.